All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity for us all to gather together as the body of Christ, to fellowship with one another, and to praise you. Lord, I ask that as we take this time now to look at your word, I pray that your word would convict us and that it would encourage us and that it would compel us to know you more and to be better servants and to be better witnesses for you, dear Lord. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our service here today. And we pray for those who can't be with us, that you would bless them and that you bring them back to us soon. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this week, when uh, we got the news that Grandma Green had died, I wasn't too surprised to have Mark ask me, Hey, Tim, you want to preach on Sunday? And of course I said yes, and of course I said I'd love to, and I do. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I'm just so busy, though. I'm so busy. I don't know how I'm going to fit this in this week. And I didn't have a busy week. I had a really busy week. And how many of you here would say you had a really busy week? Oh, we got lots of hands. We got lots of busy people here. We're all so busy. Why are we all so busy? You know, it's one thing that's kind of funny. We actually have come to the place where we kind of treat busyness like a competition. Because we're all so busy, we, we like to kind of compete. We'll have um, some people say, man, I, I've got exams coming up, and on top of that, i got my job, and I'm just so busy. And someone else might say, oh, yeah, yeah, work is tough, school's tough, but, yeah, i got three little ones at home. And they keep us up all night, and they demand constant attention. Yeah, we're, we're really busy with those kids. And someone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I rose kids. Yeah, I've been working a lot of overtime. My second business that I own is going into the busy season, and i got to finish the addition of my house before winter comes. And we all just kind of compete with busyness, and we make our busyness a badge of honor, and we want people to recognize how busy I am, like this is such a good thing. We're all so busy. Why is that? Why are we all so busy? Are we working more than we used to? Is that what it is? Well, I think... Probably not. Not really. You know, you look back 100 years ago and before, before the influence of Henry Ford, the average work week in a factory was 72 hours a week. 72 hours a week. It's pretty insane. And a lot of people worked on farms, and they worked that much easily. So why is it that we feel so busy today? We feel busier than ever. Well, I would suggest that it's not because of the amount of time that life demands from us has gone up, but because life has gotten more complicated. Life is more complex than it used to be. There are more laws and regulations behind everything we do. Everything needs insurance, licenses, permits, tax documents. Everything is so complicated nowadays. We're constantly connected to the rest of the world through our smartphones and the internet. Uh, Anyone can get a hold of you and demand your time anytime they want to. Um, We've all had it happen before. Someone texts us and we don't respond within like 10 minutes and they text back and say, are you there? We're so connected and we all expect that we all have time to just... uh, handle each other's every need and whim and that instant. And we're feel, we feel busy because we're being pulled in so many different directions nowadays. We can't keep up with, with it all. You know, in my life, um, without the help of my calendar, my to-do list, my email, and Dropbox, I couldn't possibly keep up with everything I need to do at work, in the ministry, and in my personal life. Because it's just all so complicated. Life has become so complicated, it literally drives people nuts. Now, my goal in standing here before you here today is to show you that while life may be more complicated than ever, being a Christian is not. Notice, I didn't say being a Christian is easy. I'm just saying it's not complicated. Being a Christian is hard, but it's also simple. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Luke Bassett, who was up here singing, he wrote a great article for our church blog. It was called, What to Do When God Feels Far Away. 
What to do when God feels far away? Now, oftentimes when Christians start feeling distant from God, it's not because there's some grievous sin that's gripped their heart and soul. It's because they've gotten so busy with what the Apostle Paul calls the cares of this world. We're so engrossed in our work, in our home, in our family, in our finances, in our lawns, and we don't have time for God. So what's the solution for when we feel distant from God? It's going back to the basics. And we see the basics of what Christians call, were called to do in our passage in the Bible here today, which is Acts 21, verses 41 through 47. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, open it up. I don't have any slides for you today, so you can't depend on the slides today. You're going to have to open up those Bibles. And we're going to read Acts 2, tw Acts 20, it's Acts 2, I'm sorry. Acts 2, verse 41 together. And it says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now this passage, it's describing the aftermath of Pentecost. The church, the apostles, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, remember, he had a great commission for them, but he said, wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. And they received it, they went out, they preached, and on that day, there are 3,000 souls added to the church. This is the very first church. And 3,000 people, that's massive. We would call that a mega church. We don't have a single church in Allendale that large. So it's interesting. Here we have the first church in the Bible with over 3,000 people. And it's very interesting to think, what did they do? What can we learn from this very first church, from the very beginning of church history? Now, when we, uh, we see what they did in Verse 42, and it says, And they devoted themselves to outreach programs, hosting 5Ks and block parties, park days, VBS, and classic car shows, forming committees and subcommittees, movie nights, game nights, car washes, Awana, impeccable stage props, selling church swag and book clubs, basketball leagues, golf outings, laser light shows and fog machines, creating services to accommodate everyone's musical tastes, hosting Christian concerts, missions conferences, wearing trendy outfits, work days, Christmas fundraisers, pizza parties, and starting fair trade coffee shops. And that's how the church grew. Okay. Is that what they did? No, that's not what they did. First of all, they didn't have the technology for most of that. But don't get me wrong, none of the things I listed are inherently bad. But these are the things so much of the church has become identified by. And let me put it this way. We're making things too complicated. We're making the church too complicated. We're making the Christian life too complicated. And when we make the Christian life too complicated, we create this faux Christian culture that uh, defines us by things that never defined the first church. In reality, when we think we're doing these things to reach people and bring more people in, we might actually be pushing them away because they're getting the impression that being a Christian is about doing all these kinds of things when that's not the stuff that being a Christian is about anyways. I once heard a Christian speaker share his testimony. It was a very interesting testimony. He said he grew up with zero experience with the church. He didn't grow up in the church. His parents didn't go to church. He didn't have any friends that he went to church with. Just zero experience. When he was an adult, um, he decided, I want to read the Bible for myself. And so he read the Bible. He studied it, especially the New Testament. And I'm telling you, he studied hard. He went to commentaries and ancient resources. And for three years, he made it his hobby to research the Bible, and he became a believer. Praise God, right? Now, he said the funny part is the first time he decided to go to church. Now, he said the first time he stepped into church, he might as well have been an alien, okay? 
He said here he'd been studying the word of God, studying the New Testament, reading about the church, looking at its founding, and digging in deeper than probably a lot of Christians do. And then he goes to the church and he thought, where in the world did they get this? I didn't see this in the Bible at all. And the church he went to, to him, was completely unrecognizable to what he had learned in the Bible. So I'd appeal to you, let's stop making things more complicated than they have to be. Living the Christian life is simple. Let's get back to the basics. And let's look at the first church to be our guide. So let's actually look at what they did, what was important to them, and what they devoted themselves to. Okay, so I'm going to read verse 42, and I'm going to read it for real this time. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Stop. Is that it? Just four things? No, that can't be. But it is. That's what they did. They devoted themselves to four things. And these things are powerful. And let me tell you, if you devote yourself to these four things, it will transform your walk with the Lord. So what are these four things? Let's take a closer look at each of them. The first being the apostles' teaching. Now, when Jesus came to the earth, he came to testify the truth, and he spent his ministry traveling, sharing the truth of the world, and he focused his ministry, though, on just 12 guys, just 12 misfits. And these guys, with the exception of Judas, went on to be filled with the Holy Spirit and teach the truth. You see, throughout history, God had been revealing himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Moses, to judges, to kings, and to prophets. But his ultimate revelation was to come as himself, the man, Jesus Christ. And the eleven who witnessed God in the flesh, learned from him, lived with him for years, saw him die and saw him rise again, God set apart these men. And he set apart these men to testify, to bear witness to what they had seen and touched, to tell the world the truth, and to tell the world about salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, because of their relationship with Jesus, these misfits became the men with the most critical message the world would ever hear. This message is more important than any State of the Union address, presidential speech, front page article, or TED Talk. They were commissioned to share the good news of Jesus, crucified and risen. They are messengers of God's reconciliation with men. They are witnesses to the truth that would turn the world upside down. No wonder the early church was devoted to their teaching. And we should be devoted to their teaching as well today. And of course, we get to see their teaching here in the Bible, here in the New Testament. So that's why... At our church, as a church, Pastor Mark and the elders, they're committed to expository preaching. That means we're not just coming up with a moral or some wise truism that we come up with and expounding on that. No, we always focus in on, here's a passage of the Bible, and let's look at what it says. Because when it comes down to it, our value, our wisdom is only so valuable. But the wisdom we see in the Scriptures the apostles' teaching, the very word of God, that's of infinite value. And so the scriptures, the apostles' teaching, these things are worth devoting yourself to. They're worth knowing. They're worth studying. They're worth researching. You want to know this teaching. And I know many of us here struggle. We struggle with studying our scriptures, and I get it. It can be hard. I know there's so many of us here, we've got into the new year, and we're like, you know, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. We get a Bible reading plan, maybe get an app, maybe get a year, read the Bible near your Bible, and we're like, I'm going to do this, and we're going strong, we're going strong, and then we fall a little behind, and then we fall a little more behind, and then we can't catch up, and then we just give up altogether. Most of us have done this. I know it. Well, here's my suggestion to you. If you're wondering how you can start digging deeper in the Bible, to dig deep, to try to understand it, to master it, here's an easy way to start. 
study the passage that the sermon is on. Study the passage that the sermon is on. Now, every Wednesday, we post what our sermon passage will be on the website. It's on the worship preview page. And look at that passage and read it for yourself. It's usually about eight verses. It's not even a whole chapter usually. Just read it once a day and think about it. Meditate on it day and night. Try to understand it. Take note of questions you have in the passage. And then when you come here on Sunday, after you've been meditating on it, after you've been trying to understand it, after you've been asking questions of the text, then you get to hear what Pastor Mark has to say about it. Take notes from the sermon. Then on Monday and Tuesday, go over your notes. Put it into practice. Think, how can I apply this truth in my life? How can I apply what I've learned? And you know what? You can listen to the sermon a second time as well. We actually put this out on MP3 and YouTube and video every single week. And I'll tell you what, I listen to the sermon a second time every week, and it's a huge blessing. Being completely honest, I have to listen to it because it's part of my job. (laughs) But I genuinely get as much out of it the second time as the first time. I really do. I really do. So be devoted to the apostles' teaching. And if you don't know where to start, start with the sermon passages. Just study whatever pastor's studying. And then when you come to church, you're going to be ready to engage your mind and think, man, I'm gonna un- I've been thinking about this passage. I'm ready to learn. And then let that passage just grip your heart and grip your life. So be devoted to the apostles' teaching. The second item is to be devoted to fellowship. Now, you all know what fellowship is. It's making small talk while eating cookies, right? Oh, it's so much more. It's so much more. We actually see a really good description of fellowship in the following passage. So we're going to read verses 43 and 40, 43 through 45 together. So here in Acts 2.43, it says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together... And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So what is the the definition of fellowship according to this passage? Well, there's two main descriptions. And the first is, and all who believed were together. So first of all, fellowship means they actually spent time together. They didn't just go to church on Sunday and then never see another soul from church the rest of the week. No, they needed each other. They wanted to be together. Now, Christians, we need to learn how to be together and actually spend time together. Because, you see, in our culture here in America, we're a very individualistic society. I've got my land with my house on it that holds my stuff where I like to spend my time. And anyone who infringes on our stuff, our time, is infringing on our supposed autonomy and freedom. And we tend to distance ourselves from people. Well, that's actually a dangerous place to be because you end up being an island and you're all alone. And, and, And it's just not how God designed us. You see, in my Christian walk, when I look back on my life and I see times of great spiritual growth, there was always at least one Christian in my life who I was really had good fellowship with. Whether it was someone investing in me or I was investing in them or just a really close friendship, I've never had a time in my Christian life where I've just really grown, where I didn't have that friendship. And tell you what, that Christian fellowship, it's a catalyst. It spurs on more growth. It stirs us to love and good works. So we need to learn to be together. Now, the second part of fellowship that we see in the verse, it says, and they had all things in common. But what does that mean? What does it mean to have all things in common? Verse 45 explains it, where it says, and they were selling their positions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That's powerful. That's radical. That flies in the face of the world. Now, we see instances in the scriptures where people sold their property 
They sold their land, and then they gave it to the church to help the poor, the widowed, the orphaned in their body. And we're called to do the same today. One way, one really easy way we do that as a church is we have our benevolence offering, where people give knowing this offering is going to help people in our church who have needs. And we love to help people who are suffering or who need help. But it can be even more than that. Now, I'll tell you what. Alex and I, my wife and I, we've been the beneficiaries of blessings from so many of you. So many of you. I, I can't even remember. It's probably been over a dozen times where we've been in a place where we just thought, man, things are just really tight. I'm not sure what to do. And just at the right time, someone gives us a gift card to Meyer, or someone gives us a gas card. Um, Alex and I joke about how in our first three years of marriage, we moved four times. And uh, mostly people from this church helped us move all our junk. And that's a big deal. And there's been some radical ways people in this church have blessed us and helped us along. And you know what? That's just powerful. It's so powerful. It's inspiring. It inspires me to more love and to good works. And you know what? And that doesn't just end with us. It impacts others too. Um, I've been making some friends um, who are here in Allendale and they're students and, um, and they're not um, religious people or Christians. And it was interesting. One time they were talking to us and they said, wow, your life is so different than anything I've seen because they said our lives, it's always been our immediate family might help us with something, but beyond that, everyone's out for themselves. And he said, it sounds like you guys have such, all these people in your lives that you actually like each other and help each other. And that was really a powerful testimony to them. And they thought that was pretty amazing. And so fellowship, it's so much more than small talk and eating cookies. It's having real relationships with people who actually spend time together and who actually care for each other. So put yourself in the way of fellowship. Join a small group or start a small group or even just invite people over. You know, about two years ago, Alex and I realized that we were kind of selfish with our free time and we weren't really spending a lot of time with people from church. So we made a change. Um, at first, Alex started inviting her sister and her cousin, Kenzie and Ronnie, over every Wednesday. And then we started inviting other people over. And before we knew it, we were having 5 to 15 people over every Wednesday, and we haven't stopped since. Now, you know, when I was growing up, my parents, they had a goal. They had a goal. They said, every Friday night, we want to have someone over. Every Friday night, we want to have someone over. And it wasn't just to have fun. No, it was just so that they could have Christian fellowship, and they could invest in others and also be encouraged themselves. So if you're not sure, if you're not in fellowship, you can at least start there. Just pick a day of the week where you purposefully spend time with others. It can be Friday nights. It can be Sunday lunch, whatever works for you. But pick a time and stick to it. And you can start this week. Make sure you're fellowshipping. Make sure you're building real relationships with other believers. We need it. All right, the third item on this list is the breaking of bread. Now, personally, this is my favorite part of the list. It just comes naturally to me because I love me some bread. And uh, let's read the first part of verse 46 together. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food. And I'll stop there. Now, the breaking of bread, it ties closely with fellowship, but it's worth noting on its own. It's quite important. Now, here's the thing about being a Christian. It's just a fact. You will become friends with people you normally wouldn't have. They say that just like you can't pick your biological siblings, you can't pick your spiritual siblings either. And you may have nothing in common with this other person. You might be a different age, come from different backgrounds, have very different interests, nothing in common that would ever tie you together in the rest of the world. But you can be friends because of your bond in Christ. Because Jesus has saved both of you, and you can be friends. Oh, and you know what else every Christian has in common? We all eat food. 
And so this is a really important way that humans just naturally bond is when we eat together, when we break bread together. And the first church was so devoted to breaking bread together, it was one of the main identifiers of them as believers. It says, what do the church devote themselves to? The breaking of bread. This has got to be the easiest spiritual discipline ever laid out in the Bible. All you have to do is invite someone over and eat. You can say, hey, why don't you come over for dinner? I'm not a great cook, but I can order delivery. It's that easy. There's literally no excuse for this one. Don't know how to cook? Well, KFC does. Let them do your cooking for you. Now, earlier I mentioned this group that my wife and I started, and it's now become a church small group, and we mostly invite young people and college-age people over. And one thing we do is we always eat. We always have a meal. And Alex and I, we always provide a main dish, and we let everyone else pitch in. So we get salads and sides and cookies and chips and ice cream and all sorts of stuff come in. It's nothing extravagant. We don't make lobster tail or caviar or anything like that. But tell you what, we've had lots of people and some college students say, this is the best meal I get all week. And they love it. And, and I think it's not just the food. I think it's the food and it's the fellowship. Being together with other believers, eating together, talking with one another. And I'll tell you what, this might sound crazy. We have a gathering of Christians and we don't do a Bible study. And we don't do that because we decided we want to focus on these other things. The fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And so that's our fourth thing, is the prayers. So let's read together, starting in verse 46. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And we'll stop there. I want to point out something very, very important. I believe the last part of verse 46 and the beginning of 47 is also describing their prayers and how they prayed. And it's interesting to think how the emphasis here is on praising God. The emphasis of their prayers was praise. Now notice, it's not saying, and they requested God that he would take care of their financial needs and their medical issues and their great aunt's neighbor's medical issues. No, they were praising God. See, prayer is worship. Prayer is worship. We're so self-focused in our culture. We're so consumer-oriented that we tend to treat God like a wish list, and I am completely guilty of this. We treat God like he's a cosmic Santa Claus. We pray like we send our Christmas list to the North Pole because we think, oh, I couldn't hurt. I might get what I want. You know, when I was in middle school, here was my prayer, eighth grade. I had the same prayer every night. It was, thank you, Jesus, for this day, like every good prayer starts. Please forgive my sins. I pray that I'll have good friends. And if it be your will, I pray that Alex Green will like me. (laughs) And it turns out my wish came true, and we're married here today. So middle schoolers, there's hope. Anyways, here's the thing. This is how good God is, is he lavishes so much good on us that we don't deserve. But we tend to focus on what we don't have. God, I want more money. I want more comfort. I want less stress. I want more peace. I want, I want, I want. And we forget about how good God has already been to us. We live in the wealthiest country in the world. I have air conditioning. I have refrigeration, clean drinking water, sturdy walls, shelves full of books, Netflix, food, cars, and mostly reliable health care. When we keep all our blessings in mind, our prayer should be more like, Dear Lord, I just want to thank you. You've been so good to us. You've taken care of us. You've taken care of my greatest need. You've saved me through your son, Jesus Christ. And you go beyond that and you take care of my physical needs and you've taken care of me over and over and over 
again. And I trust that you will continue to take care of me. And Lord, I just want to thank you for being who you are. I want to praise you for being Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I want to thank you for being Emmanuel, God with us. You are so good. You are so good. That's how we should be praying. And we need to remember that God is good. And we need to praise him for it. And we need to be mindful of our blessings every day and thank him, knowing that he takes care of our every need. Our every need. Now, <laughs> being a Christian is not complicated. And let's finish our passage together by reading verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord God added to their number day by day, those who are being saved. Now notice the first church was devoting themselves to these four things, the apostles teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayer, and the Lord added to their number day by day. And so let me just encourage you. Do you want to turn around your Christian walk? Devote yourself to these things. Do you want to make a difference in your family? Devote yourself to these things. Want to reach your friends and family for Jesus? Devote yourself to these things. At the end of your life, do you want to know that you've made a difference? Devote yourself to these things. Now I say this to you as a warning and as an encouragement. If you're not doing these things, you're handicapping your spiritual walk. You're handicapping your spiritual growth. If you're too busy for these simple things, you need to take an honest look at your priorities. But if you're ready to grow, if you're ready to mature, if you're ready to be used, if you're ready to change, it's not complicated. It's simple. It's so simple. And so for those of you who, and I believe there are uh, many of us here, who are doing a fairly good job devoting our lives to these things. Let me just encourage you. Let these verses transform the way you disciple others. Don't disciple others and make things too complicated. Focus in on the basics. Focus in on these things. Personally, when I'm working with, investing in discipling a young or new believer, I instantly think, all right, we need to do a Bible study, we need to start learning some theology, we need to start learning some apologetics, let's go, let's just dump information into their brains, and that's the way I kind of think, that's what I naturally want to do. But it's true, while young believers need teaching, they also need fellowship. They also need time spent with believers breaking bread together. And they also need prayer. And so in our discipleship, let's focus on these things. And let me share with you something I've observed. I grew up doing inner city ministry with my parents. And then even as an adult, I spent many hours um, doing ministry with poor people and the homeless. I even uh, lived at a homeless shelter for a while as an RA. And let me tell you something. I've seen it over and over again. We see someone come to the Lord, and it's amazing. And they're just on fire. And they're learning, and they're in Bible studies, and they're going to church, and they're just excited, and they're turning their life around. And then maybe they get that first job and start paying down their debts, maybe even get a second job. But you know what happens very often? As the busyness of life starts to take over, they start to stop hanging out with other Christians. They drop out of fellowship, drop out of Bible study. Maybe their job requires that they work on Sundays. And they become isolated and drift away from the support of other believers. And then they end up messing up and going back to drugs or drinking or whatever, and, and they get their some themselves into trouble. And I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over again. And I share that to say, when you're discipling someone, and you see them start pulling out of fellowship. And it might seem like for genuine reasons at first. You need to step in and say, hey, I know you're so busy. But don't neglect gathering together. It's so dangerous. We need each other. We need you to be with us. And you need to be with us. So let me tell you. 
The first time I noticed this passage, it's Acts 2, verse 42, and I saw what the early church was devoted to. It changed my life. It really did. And I hope it will change yours too. Let it change your Christian walk. Let it change the way you disciple others. Because as we see in this passage, as they devoted themselves to these things, the Lord added, added to their number day by day. There's power in simplicity. And being a Christian isn't complicated. Living the Christian life isn't complicated. Devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. It's simple. But the question is, will you do it? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this group of believers. And I thank you that so many of us have rich fellowship. Lord, I pray for anyone who's in here who might feel like they're drifting from you. Or they might feel isolated. Lord, I pray that things would turn around here quickly. Because, Lord, we know that you haven't called us to busyness for busyness' sake. No, you've called us with a purpose. And I pray that with a laser focus, we would be devoted to what you've called us to do. And that we trust that as we're doing these things, that you will use us, that you will work through us, and that the world will be reached for you. Lord, I pray a blessing on everyone here, and that as we go into our week, that we would be witnesses and salt and light for the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.